Thanks for staying up later. Tonight we continue our week of acting special editions, parts of the conversations we've had with some of the most memorable actors and actresses who've appeared on the program over the years. Tonight, Dennis Hopper, Kirk Douglas, Harvey Keitel. When Hopper was here, we talked about everyone from James Dean to Jack Nicholson to David Lynch. Now, he's always been something of a rebel, and that's meant several run-ins with the Hollywood establishment. Let's start with a classic confrontation Dennis Hopper had with an old line director named Henry Hathaway. Hathaway, it seems, wanted a scene done a certain way, and Hopper refused. And the two went eyeball to eyeball for almost a whole day. Started about 7 in the morning to about 11 at night. He sent for lunch and dinner. He told me we'd go that way for, he had, he had enough film to go four months. And he owned, uh, he owned 40% of 20th Century Fox. So we were going to stay there until I did the scene his way. And it was a 10-line scene. And uh, I did it, I don't know, I'm going to say 86. I always said I was 86th, you know, 86 takes. But however many I did, uh, I did it as many ways as I could possibly think of doing it. And then he'd keep giving me the line readings and telling me when to pick up the coffee cup, when to put it down, what to do. So. Well, you were trying to do what James Dean had encouraged you yeah. to do. Yeah. A broader understanding of acting than just read the lines and take right. the director's instructions literally. Yeah, and he wanted me to go back you know, to the other way of working. So anyway, that's where it, that's where it ended. And uh, I finally broke down, did it his way, and left. And I didn't work again till seven, eight years later in Hollywood. I came to New York, studied with Strasburg uh, for five years, so on. I didn't get rehired in Hollywood again until Hathaway hired me. Hathaway and Wayne hired me uh, some seven, eight years later for a picture called uh, Sons of Katie Elder. Anyway, I come into the office, and uh, he tells me, he says, uh, I got this part for you. And it's the same part. So it's the weak the weak uh, the weakling son the weak good son of the bad man mm -hmm. you know and uh he says i got this part for you and he says big duke and i uh, you know if duke doesn't like this method you know i don't want any of that method and duke doesn't like that he says now but uh, you know he says uh, you know duke and i have talked and you're married now to a nice irish woman's daughter i was married to margaret sullivan's daughter and she was a nice Irish woman, and now you have a daughter of your own, and Duke and I think that you should start working again. So, uh, you know, Duke doesn't like that method, so we can't have any of that stuff. And I said, well, Mr. Hathaway, I'm just, you know, I'm a much better actor than I was then, and we're going to get along. I'm not going to be any problem. Oh, you were never a problem, kid. Never a problem for me. Never, never. You know, just Duke doesn't like this stuff, so just watch it, okay? I said, fine. First day, we get the location. We're in Mexico, Durango, Mexico, and uh, there is uh, John Wayne. John Wayne is not in the scene. It's early in the morning, 6 in the morning. John Wayne is there. Hal Wallace is there. Hathaway is there. And I am now doing a 10-line scene with the bad man father, almost identical to the one eight years before that I get blackballed for. He comes to me. He gives me every, letter, every gesture, every line reading, Okay. Now, I've watched his movies. The man never moves his camera. You know, very seldom does he ever uh, lay a dolly track. It's mm -hmm. all close up, over the shoulder, long shot. Never moves the camera. So he gives you these really ridiculous kind of moves and things because he wants you to move, but he can't explain it because he's a screaming, yelling guy with a cigar, you know? <laughs> hey, just do it, just do it! You know, he's one of those. So, yeah. So anyway, he gives me the line where he's going to... And I do it, and first take, and he goes, print it! And he comes up to me, and he's got this cigar in his mouth, and he's crying, and he's hugging me, and he said, that was great, kid, that was just great! I said, you see, Henry, I'm a much better actor than I was <laughs> eight years ago. And he says, you're not a better actor, kid, you're not a better actor, you're just smarter, you're just smarter! <laughs> yeah, that's it. Yeah. That's it. And he was right. I was just smarter. <laughs> you did Sons of Katie Elder and then later True Grit, True Grit. with John Wayne. And if I've got my timing right, um, <laughs> True Grit is just a year or so after Easy Rider. Right, but I'm, I'm now editing Easy Rider, and Schneider says, go and do it for the old man. He just wants seven days. Nobody will edit your movie. Just go, go and do it. It's a shame a kid like Moon losing his leg. 
Too young to be hopping around on a little peg. Loves to dance too much. Sports. You trying to get at me again? I'm getting at you with the truth. We seen Ned Mays two days ago at McAllister. You blow it on Trinia. I'm playing out, Quincy. I gotta have a doctor. I'll tell what I know. Can't do a thing for you, son. Your partner's killed you, and I've done for him. Okay. And don't leave me laying here. Don't let those words get me. Well, I'll see you get buried. Yeah, Wayne used to chase me around. He had a 45, and he arrived in a helicopter. Wayne lived on a, uh, excuse me, a Diet Coke got to me. Uh, <laughs> Well, you got to watch what you put inside you, Dennis. you got to really be careful. Yeah. <laughs> that last glazed donut. They say they got Elvis, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's really weird. But uh, poor Elvis, gun. Anyway, let's see, where was I? Oh, yeah. Uh, John Wayne, True John Grit. John Wayne, True Grit. Oh, God, John Wayne. He lived in Newport on a minesweeper, okay? And he had a helicopter, and he would fly to Paramount Studios, and he would arrive there. And uh, every time anything happened at UCLA or USC that one of his daughters was at a political rally or Eldridge Cleaver, Eldridge Cleaver was somewhere, gave a speech and used bad language in front of his daughter. It was my fault. And he would arrive <laughs> in the helicopter and say, where's that pinko hopper? I know he's here hiding somewhere. And I'd always go to Glenn Campbell's dressing room and hide. And he'd, I know you're in there somewhere. You come out, you pinko. You know, my <laughs> daughter, Eldridge Cleaver, was cussing in front of my daughter last night, and I want to talk to you about it. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. It's crazy. Through a half-century career, Kirk Douglas has managed to be successful playing good guys and bad guys. In fact... Somebody once wrote that he is a good actor because he can show the virtue in every heel and the flaw in every hero. Here's Kirk Douglas. Couldn't be a nicer compliment. As a matter of fact, that's one of the things that have always guided me in anything that I've done. If I play a weak character, I started off playing a very weak character in The Strange Love of Martha Ivers. I try to find a moment when he's strong. I remember in the picture, I played this weak alcoholic, you know, district attorney married to Barbara Stanwyck and she wants Van Heflin. And then I remember at one point I got up and I grabbed Van Heflin. I remember the look at his face. He didn't expect me to play it that way. Tell why I became district attorney. Tell why you made me hang that man. Tell the truth. I told the truth. They were like leeches, both of them. They wanted everything. All I ever wanted everything was you. you want. Everything you have, you I gave, gave you. Then go! <laughs> You're insane. You're out of your mind. Me too. You see, Sam, how close we really are to each other. Don't break up our happy home. It'll have to be you or me. And unless you do it now, it'll be you. But I felt every weak man has some strength in him, just as every strong man has weakness in him. Otherwise, it's dull. You know, someone who's just macho all the time is dull. You look for vulnerability, no matter how tough a character you play, or if I'm writing, I look for where they are vulnerable, because that's something we can all identify with. We can all identify with weakness. That's why weakness is easier to deal with than success. We've all had more weakness to deal with in our life than successes. Now, John Wayne was a friend of yours, but he didn't see it with that kind of subtlety. I read a very interesting story where when you did Lust for Life and played Vincent Van Gogh, he in effect said to you in the vernacular of that time, guys like us, we can't play queers like him. We can't play wimps That's like right. that, right? That's right. And I said, hey, John, I'm an actor. You know, I'm trying to play an English. What are you talking? We got an obligation to the public. We got to play tough guys. No, he really meant it. It always you know, made me laugh because you see, I think that's one of the problems Really, that's one of the problems happening all over. TV, news reports. You see, it mixes. You see, there's not... People have got to be aware of what is make-believe and what is reality. And even in what's happening, I mean, news shows begin to have simulated scenes. You don't know what's real and what's phony. 
And I think that's what happens, that's what I think is important when I'm talking to my sons, you know, especially Michael. Hey, you gotta know what your job is. Don't think you are the role that you play. I am not Spartacus, although... <laughs> no, I am Spartacus. <laughs> you know, and he is Spartacus, and yeah. he is Spartacus, you know. <laughs> you, you laugh. Since they've revived Spartacus, I come out doing a show, and there are a bunch of kids there with, you know, getting, waiting for autographs, and they start that. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. I'm Spartacus. <laughs> ah, shut up. <laughs> into the character of Vincent van Gogh because your philosophy has always been don't take the character home with you but this guy got inside you as That's you right. tried to get inside That's him. That's right Bob. You see uh, I always say to somebody would say oh they see a movie they say oh Kirk you were boy you were lost in that role. I said no. You were lost in the role. I wasn't. My job is to have the discipline know what I'm doing have all the emotion all that but uh, Lust for Life was a little different. Uh, van Gogh is uh, such a pathetic character that it really got to me. Love can go to hell. Oh, he helps me when he's in the mood. The rest of the time, he doesn't care whether I'm dead or alive. Oh, I'm sorry, my boy. Go home. I can't see you now. Go home and work with those cats. I'm working with those idiotic cats. Wait, don't look down your nose at those cats of his. He sells what he paints. I don't want to hear about his beautiful. My wife used to say, I used to come slumping home with the same walk that he had. And for, you know, for, I don't think I ever saw that movie for a couple years after it was done. Because it was so pathetic to me that this great artist died committing suicide, thinking he was a failure. And you know, it only made me feel worse when, you know, these auctions would come up and his paintings were sold for millions and millions of dollars. And the poor guy never knew what a great artist he was. And I felt that was, uh, that was very sad to me. And it affected me. As a matter of fact, I sold a lot of the so-called important paintings that we had. I put them in my charitable foundation. It gives me some money to do some of the things I want to do because I began to feel guilty about having a so-called masterpiece on the wall that costs so much money. And my wife and I, my wife knows and knows much more about art than I do, we now buy paintings by living artists. So they know that we like their work and bought their painting. It's gratifying, I think, to them and to us. It must have been especially affecting because a lot of this was shot on location. So you're walking through the little town where Van Gogh exactly. spent his life, and there's an unbelievable story about these old peasants who, I guess, you, you got him down to such a, a point where they almost, half-joking, half-serious, thought he'd come back. That's right. Oh, some of them actually thought, you know, uh, real peasants in over sur -Oise. That's where he died uh, in a little cafe. And that's what, which is still there, and that's where he's buried with his brother Theo, two simple graves. It's true. We, we went through all the uh, places. But I did look. At, it was a frightening resemblance with the reddish hair and the, and the reddish beard. I, I, really, I really felt <laughs> that was Van Gogh. Really yeah. did. And that really destroyed all the theories I had about acting. You don't really get lost in the part. But it sometimes happens. I'm not afraid of emotion. When I paint the sun, I want to make people feel it revolving, giving off light and heat. When I paint a peasant in the field, I want to feel the sun pouring into him like it does in the corn. Is that what you think you're doing when you overload your brush? When you slap paint on like putty? When you make your trees rise like snakes and your sun explode all over the canvas? With all your talk of emotion, what I see when I look at your work is just that you paint too fast. You look too fast! Did it get to the point where your presence was indistinguishable from your talent? You know, there's Kirk Douglas. Well, I think uh, sometimes that works against you. For example, when I did, uh, you know, One Flow of the Cuckoo's Nest, I mean, I did it as a play. Mm -hmm. I bought the book. Bob, I had it for about 10, 12 years. I put my own money in it, made it, uh, paid someone to make a, a play out of it, went to Broadway, took no salary, did it as a play for six months, and I tried like mad to make it into a movie. And finally, when Michael said he was doing Streets of San Francisco, look, Dad, let me try. I said, okay, we'll be partners, you try. The director of that, Milos Foreman, didn't want me 
he said, well, we don't want to star. We want to have an ensemble casting. And this was a part that I was dying to play. So sometimes the fact that you make a certain impact in films can work against you. Wasn't Jack Nicholson a star, though, too, even by then? Maybe not as big no, a star as he became. No, he but... was, no, he became a star after that. And, of course, what burned me up is he was so good in the part, you know. <laughs> that, was, that was difficult to take. He was wonderful in it, yeah. No, but that was a big disappointment. And I was being penalized. Well, he said, we want more of an ensemble group. We don't want a, any real stars. We know he was terrific. You've got no quarrel with that. But how would you have done it differently? Well... As a matter of fact, I always said to Michael, Michael, it's a big artistic success, it's a commercial success, we've all made a lot of money, but you did it wrong. And, uh, you know, of course, that shows you a little bit about my character. I said, you see, the biggest thing that they did wrong, if you remember the piece at all, you see, I don't know, I guess this is late at night, you can discuss it. Very late, thing. go ahead. Oh, okay. See, I said, look, when he is trying to show the men in the asylum, to get them out of that, and to show this big nurse, what a phony she is. I said, you have Jack Nicholson grabbing her and almost choking her. And then she comes in with a, you know, she hurt her neck. I said, that's not it. If he wants to demolish her in front of the men, the way I was going to do it, he takes her, lays her down on the floor and has sex with her. And she responds and all the men are watching. And they see her responding. They see what frustrations there were in her and what she wanted. That's how they demolish her. And I said, if you did it my way, it might not have made a nickel, but it would have been right. <laughs> it's interesting that you could have been the colonel in Rambo, the guy who makes Stallone into this vicious, almost cartoon-like fighting machine. But why didn't you take the role? Well, I had the part. I told the director what I wanted to do with it. He agreed with me. And my, again, you, you know my theories. I told, whenever somebody makes a hit, I told them how, what, what they did wrong with it. There again, <laughs> Stallone... They had Rambo, the beginning of Rambo. I said, I'll take the part, but at the end, I must kill Rambo. The director said, you're wrong. I said, look, I created this fighting machine. I have to destroy him. He said, you're right. We went to shoot it. Stallone didn't agree with that. He said, no, he has to live. I quit the picture. I said, you, you, you know, you abrogated my contract. So I've often said to Stallone, I look, Stallone, if you'd listened to me, you might have lost a billion dollars, but it would have been right. <laughs> <laughs> With his recent success in The Bad Lieutenant and The Piano, Harvey Keitel has seen his status change in the eyes of Hollywood. Always a respected actor, he's now arguably what's called a bankable star. Here's what Keitel had to say just two years ago about that kind of stardom. What's the difference between stardom and recognition? My impression is... A lot is, of money. <laughs> my, my, impress, my impression is mm. that stardom is not something you've pursued but what sort of recognition are you legitimately interested in recognition comes as a result of um recognition can come without stardom in that your work can be such that it that it has a meaning and importance for a body of people and therefore you are recognized but you could be denied the stardom because the films have not been huge hits or your particular role in that film was not large enough to be considered by the star makers, the major studios and the producers, as being uh, 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 that important a part of that project. Do you think there's something that you would like to do that you're capable by your own lights of doing? Yes. But that you're not seen by the right people as being able to do and yes. it's an itch you'd like to scratch eventually? Yes. And that would be... A star. A lead role. <laughs> I'm being a little cute here. Um, uh, let me see. You are a working man as an actor. And like any working man, the more control you have over your business, uh, 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 that will affect the, um, the character of your work. Only a star can create his own work. Now, let me sort of be devil's advocate here just for a moment, because this might be important to other actors and directors watching. Um, for the most part, what I just said is true. Only a star can direct and create his own work. If I was a bankable star now, you had some idea that I liked. I could say, okay, Bob, we're taking it to a studio. We're doing it. Without being a star, you cannot do this. Now, 
younger directors and actors, or you don't even have to be younger, they can, with a great deal of struggle, create their own projects. They can hustle money from you, from the cameraman, from their friends and relatives yeah. to make their movies. And then they will be stars. They will be able to create, I mean, a star in the sense I'm speaking about it. They will be able to create their own projects. My advice to them would be, by the way, don't wait to be made a star. If I had one thing to do over again, it would be to collect the talent I've been fortunate to rub elbows with in my, in my rise. And much earlier in my career, get these people together and say, let's make our own films. Let's not rely on becoming stars in Hollywood terms. We can be stars. You know how I'm using that word. The only real stars are in the heavens. But we can be stars if we will struggle and make our own films. We do not have to wait for Hollywood to define us as bankable, non-bankable. Bankable, non-bankable. Tomorrow night, folks, we'll run this drill again, this time with Donald Sutherland, Ossie Davis, and Robert Duval. Until then, we'll see you later. Thanks.